And that's how Stevie Wright met Dennis Allen, Mr. Death. Oh, hello. Thanks for joining me here at the Guitar Colonel Log Cabin, deep in the Victorian hills. I'm just reading Panderson Bedtime Stories and reminiscing about classic Australian rock. Speaking of classic rock, a Mr. Steve Kilby from the church was nice enough to come in here for a chat with us not so long ago. Should we revisit that interview with Steve? He was a lovely guy. Do you remember when he came in? I think he was talking about mm, Rickenbackers and Paisley shirts and things. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Kilby is here. Hello, how are you? How are you going, mate? I'm going very well. Welcome to Melbourne. Thank you. We Thank you. We turned on the weather for you. Lovely weather, and it? 63 degrees, mm. sunshine, swans, cygnets. <laughs> <laughs> cygnets? Yeah, swans and cygnets in the park. Very nice. Oh, yeah. you were, were you at Albert Park Lake? In the, the Botanic Gardens, Gardens with my Lovely. daughter. Fantastic. Steve, uh, when I was a teenager, yeah, um, and in the 80s in Brisbane, uh, there was cold chisel and ACDC and that sort of thing, yeah. a lot of yelling. Um, but if you didn't like that, there was one band, and that was your band, The Church, that a lot of people, a lot of my friends loved and sort of went in that direction. I think a lot of people had that heyday record. Yeah. I think you're also responsible for uh, people in the middle of summer going out in tight black pants and <laughs> jeans uh, <laughs> and pointy boots yeah, yeah. and the paisley shirts, yeah. you know, with jackets in Brisbane. But uh, what, what are your memories of that sort of, of the 80s? That particular time was that a good time? It was up and down all the time. Um, Heyday really. We sort of started off with a big bang, and then we kind of, then we kind of went into a bit of a slump. So eighty one, eighty two were really good for us, and then eighty three, eighty four, eighty five, we sort of struggled a bit, mm. and then Heyday came out, and we sort yeah. of. We were re reborn all over again, and then Starfish came out, and we sort of moved up into the next level. Yes. Um, but the eighties was sort of at any any. I never felt secure. I always felt like it all all could come to an end at any any point in time. And there were always people saying, in you know, it's, it's pretty funny now to think of it, but people saying in nineteen eighty three, the church are washed up. <laughs> They've had it's all over. You know. They got no had prospects, nothing. Yeah, they had a good <laughs> run. They're not going to play anymore. You should just forget about them. They should stop embarrassing themselves and go home. <laughs> so it's sort of, it was very insecure. Mm. You never, it seemed like it could all end at any moment. It seemed like you were only as big as your last th thing that you did. And if, if you didn't, if radio didn't play your last single and you weren't on Countdown or whatever the, the, benchmark was mm. it seemed like it all could end very quickly you, your sort of sound uh for me has been fairly consistent yeah uh obviously the songs are different but there's something if i put on the most recent church record that came mm. out in two, 2017 and then i listen to something like heyday or mm. starfish it's kind of got this film-esque continuity yeah, yeah yeah there's a certain air to it um uh, when you're uh, i mean you're obviously recording in different studios with different producers. Uh -huh. What do you do when you go in there? And do they, they obviously have a knowledge of your history and we're going to try and create this sound? Or what did you I think do before that? I think it's just like an author that who, who writes books his whole life. You would expect continuity. Like Shakespeare, you, you get continuity and there's a continuity of thought behind the church which started with me and, and then which Peter Coppus, you know, when he and I started playing together, a certain sound, a certain, a certain standard, a certain kind of thing the church has to be. Mm. The church can't be, if we went in the studio and someone started going, ah, 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 <laughs> I lost my baby, ah, ah. Someone's gonna go, but that's not the church, and you that'll know, be the end no, of it. No blues it's, record from you. Then. Nothing like that. <laughs> or, or millions of other things, you yeah. know, whatever it is. Um, it's got to be churchy. Yeah. And I guess me, I guess I'm the, the number one knower of what should be churchy, but all the other guys in the band sort of know what should be churchy as well. So mm. 
whatever we do and whoever we work with and wherever it is, it has to be churchy. Mm. And that's very hard to define, but we very quickly know when it isn't. Mm. Someone will go, you know what, we shouldn't be doing something like this. It isn't, it's, it's beneath us. <laughs> What's your, so when you started playing, yeah. did you start on guitar or did you go straight to bass? Um, I got a bass. Um, I got a bass for my birthday when I was 16. But at the same time, I bought a really cheap acoustic guitar and I sort of learned to play them. I learned to play chords on a guitar simultaneously, but I never had any intention of being a guitarist, but I always had an intention of being a bass player. But I sort of realised if I wanted to be a songwriter, I should, I should know my way around on a guitar as well. Did you get lessons? I never had lessons, no. Okay, so One day, after I'd had... After I'd been playing bass for about a year, a friend of mine said, I know this guy called Ben. You should give Ben a call. He's a bass player. And I rang up this guy called Ben and he came round and in half an hour he gave me a lesson that showed me everything I ever really needed to know. And that was sort of, I think, major and minor scales. Mm -hmm. he, so he said, you know, when the guitarist plays A major, you play this scale. When he plays A minor, you do this scale. And he also showed me, he showed me what Paul McCartney was doing, sliding and slurring. And so he showed me like boom, 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 which seems so obvious. But when you're a 17 year old bass player, you don't know how Paul McCartney's going, how he's doing that. So he showed me slurring and sliding and... I can hear that influence in your huh? playing. I can hear that. The slurring and sliding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a lot of... Um, our second last album, Peter Copper said, this is our portamento album. It's all portamento. He said, we are the kings of portamento. Um, yeah, so this guy came around and sort of gave me a half hour, like a, he sort of taught me everything he knew about that I would need to keep going for the next. And, you know, when I play a, little, a minor scale now, when it's a, a minor chord and I play my little minor scale, I think back to Ben. I can still see him sitting in the living room with his long red hair in Canberra one warm afternoon showing me everything I could find out about bass in like <laughs> half an hour. Um, so I recommend everybody do something like that. Yeah. But for me, for me playing bass, playing guitar, writing songs, writing lyrics, recording itself, getting playing keyboards, all the things I've ever done, I've taught myself. And um, I feel like teaching yourself is, the pre is a prereq prerequisite. All the great players I've ever known, all the people I've really respect, they sort of all have taught themselves. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder about all these colleges where people are learning to play rock and roll. I feel like going along, standing there and going, as soon as you walk in that building, you're already losing your, your, it's, or when I, when I do a songwriting workshop, which I don't do anymore, but mm. people would go, you know, uh, I would say, first of all, the fact that you're at this songwriting workshop makes me feel like you're none of you will ever be a songwriter mm. because songwriters don't go to fucking songwriting workshops <laughs> and rock that's, and roll stars good. don't go to college to learn to be rock and roll stars. What do you think of, um, you know, having such a long history in the, in the business, what do, what do you think of all these talent shows that are on well, TV, and, like The Voice? Well, yeah, yeah, well, they're, yeah, but they're, they're great. Yeah, you're going to find great singers. Mm. You're going to find great entertainers. But you're not going to find your fucking next David Bowie. You're not going to find your next Paul McCartney. You're not going to mm. find your next Bob Dylan or whoever, whoever, you know, it is that you respect. Mm. You're just going to find a guy who can, like Las Vegas days, mm. You know, like they seem, they seem Dean Martin, you know, yeah. like everybody. Look. <laughs> yeah, you'll find that on a talent show and you'll find yeah. people with talent who can sing. But real talent. I mean, if I'd gone on one of those talent shows, I wouldn't have even, you know, I wouldn't have even got an audition. They would have said, who the hell is this guy? Maybe if he, you did the Dean Martin song. though. What's that? If you did Dean Martin, though, you never know. It if I'd done it. Dean Martin. <laughs> but I don't think, I don't think the people the judges and stuff, they're not qualified. They can't, 
they can't pick up on the zeitgeist. Mm. They're not qualified. They can't see it. They won't know it. Mm. They can only know something that's already gone past. Mm. A, a real talent, a real, you know, that Paul Simon song, every generation throws a hero up the pop charts. Mm. The kids have to understand. Mm. You have to do something, the kids, that's pretty funny coming from me, but <laughs> the audience, you have to do something the audience can dig. Mm. And I don't think that Seal or the, one of the, girls in the, from the Spice Girls or Guy, Sebastian, whoever it is, I don't think they can spot that kind of genius mm. just sitting on a TV show, some guy coming on. They don't, they, they don't necessarily know what it is. And I worry that people who go on one of those shows and get rejected might feel they don't have a chance. Whereas I, I'm always barracking for the guy on his own in a bedroom, slogging it out, figuring it all out, mm. figuring out multi-track recording, figuring out how to sing with himself, figuring out reverbs and echoes and choruses and guitar solos. That's the guy I'm rooting for, the yeah. loner, yeah. sorting it all out for himself. Because if you learn, as soon as you learn from someone else, mm. you know, you're picking up somebody else's ideas. What, what, do, you, what do you think of, of all of the modern ways of pr promoting yourself now? So it, it's less about record sales and more about YouTube views and, and uh, playing live and... Uh, look, I don't really know. Look, look, it, I'm just a musician. I'm a singer, I'm a songwriter, I play bass guitar, I grew up in a different era. I don't know what people do these days. I don't have any opinion on YouTube and SoundCloud and <laughs> iTunes and doing s s set lists for Spotify and this and this and this. I, you know, I get out a bass guitar and, oh, baby, I want them. You know, that's what I do. And however however that gets presented or put out there, I'm no longer attached to it. Do you, do you have a production company that, that helps with your marketing now? How, how is that done? No, how is I've, your US tour? No, I, no I just randomly do things like this record that's behind us now, behind us on the... On the Sydney Rococo on the screen here. Exactly. Um, for example, that was a guy came to me and said, um, I'll give you some money if you'll make a record um, for me. I go, all right. Um, and he said, he said, um, I'd like you to make a record that's something like the Electric Light Orchestra. And I said, do I get to have strings? And he said, of course. And I said, yeah. I'm in. <laughs> bang. So bang, that one's on. Jeff Done, on. finished. Very nice. Uh, what the next thing will be, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how, for myself, opportunities just are turning up all the time. Would you like to make an album with me? Would you like to write lyrics for this? Would you like to do some songs? Um, with the church, it's more of a sort of a, a little. There's more of a little industry, and with advisors and managers and accountants and lawyers and people going, you should do this and do that and do this and do that. So. Um, the church is far more organised and has far more strategies, has a social media person. and But me, I'm more like, you know, if I walked in here today and you said, I I've got a mate who lives in Taiwan and he wants to make an album and he he'll give you $15,000 to go over there and play bass and produce it, I might very well go, all right, yeah, I'll go and do that. You know, I I'm not sort of, there's no plan. I just, I just sort of meander along and... Just like you contacted me the other day and said, do you want to come in and talk to the guitar colonel? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'll do that. And um, somebody else will say, do you want to do this? And I'll go, yeah, I'll do that. So I just, I just will meander along and like a whale swallowing the <laughs> krill of all the opportunities coming my way. And well, I, your, you your know, whale meandering has worked quite well. But there you go. How did you become such a good to great songwriter? When you first started, like what... Because you, you obviously had a good ear for it. So what in, in the beginning, All right. you tried writing some songs. Did you think they were good? No, but it was, more, it was much more than that. It was like, when I was four, I, I always tell this story, but this is the truth. When I was four, my parents had two records. We were very poor. One of the records was a record by Frank Sinatra called Only the Lonely, which was an album full of these really sad love songs, Unrequited Love, Love Lost, accompanied by Nelson Riddle's orchestral arrangements. And the four-year-old me would sit there and listen to this record 
and wonder and wonder and wonder and wonder about the way he sang and what all the instruments were doing and did had these things really happened to Frank Sinatra or no he was singing some of the songs other people had written so what was his relationship then how did he manifest this and why did this sad music make me feel happy and why did my father think this record was so great and so I was always fascinated with songs and singing and songwriting. The fact that my father was a piano player and always talking about music and extolling the virtues of music sort of helped me. Um, so I was always set up and fascinated with music all along. And I'm like you, I saw kids at school playing the guitar and voice inside my in my head was outraged like that's you you should be sitting there under that tree not Ian Hogue <laughs> strumming the guitar um, so I guess when I was 16 I began to put it all into practice I was like um, you know I'm gonna be a bass player and a songwriter and you know Mark Boland came along and then David Bowie came along and sort of showed me sort of the way to do it or the way I could do it, the way I could sort of squeeze in. And, um, and from then on in, I just persevered. Um, I don't have a lot of really raw natural talent. I'm not a guy who can just pick up a guitar and go, Wah! and people go, fuck. But if you leave me alone with it for sort of five or six hours, when you come back, I would have hammered something out that sort of, that came from sort of intelligence and perseverance rather than some raw natural talent yes yeah it always it always surprises me when you you have a famous song and the songwriter says oh i just banged that out in 10 minutes like wow yeah. okay amazing but so in the writing process i'll get on to ian hogan in a minute actually but yeah. uh, the writing process are you sitting down with an acoustic guitar writing yourself taking it to the band or the band gets together and jams and jams something else. Every single way you could imagine. Right. Every single thing, every way you can write a song, I write songs. So a lot of my songs were written um, with using multi-track to write with. So, you know, which in a simple, simplest state would have been in 1977, I got a domestic four track the first one there ever was before that there were huge great things you need yeah. eight guys in white coats to work them in a license <laughs> you know what i mean and, yes and dangerous. tea breaks and all that <laughs> suddenly tiak made this one it was like this oh, big okay yeah. 1977 i got that home and i wrote songs by um i might put a a, a drum beat on there going boom boom kick, and boom boom kick. and then i might get a bass guitar and go boom 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 boom, 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 boom. And then I might get another guitar and go, mm, ah, ah. and then another guitar going, diddle it, diddle it. And then a keyboard going, ah, oh. adding and adding and adding and learning how to, how to um, bounce it down and then put more and more on. Eventually I'd come up with these backing tracks. And then when I had the backing track, I would sit, the backing track would suggest what I should sing over the top. But I could never say, or I could never tell anyone, I was always just following my nose, mm. that if I put all these little bits, these pointillistic little bits down, something would come out of it in the end. And eventually I started writing songs and no one could figure out how I was writing these songs because they weren't the sort of songs you could write sitting down with a guitar mm. and going, ah, da, 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 da. <laughs> but I also did that as well. Do you, I, do you have the melody in your head first or do you... No, the melody music? usually is the last thing that comes. Okay. When everything else is recorded, usually I figure out the melody and the lyrics. So something like Unguarded Moment. Yeah. Um, it starts with a classic riff. It's like yeah. a C to a G, I think. Yeah. Memory, it sounds, it sounds like that. Did, did, you, did you come up with that riff? Yeah. You, so that's yeah, I would have sat there on a... Uh, I would have sat there and gone... You know, it would have been like this. Ooh, yeah, you know, I would have sat there and gone, I've been sitting on the sofa and gone. And then, you know, I would have gone. So, la 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 la. What lyric could that be? You know, finding in the You know, and then 
you know, a bit more, a bit more of the riff, and sort of then taking along to the band and showing them my clum. Sorry about that's right. Showing them my clumsy thing that I had, yeah. and they would sort of turn it into the song. Yeah, that it was sort of like that. When yeah, I, like nothing, nothing yeah. very grandiose. Yeah, that's cool. But that's a great tune. I, I, that, when I first heard that song, it was like nothing, n nothing else Australian really that I'd heard at the time. I just I remember that song very vividly on the yeah. radio, and uh, yeah, and and kind of the vocals were this a great vocal, but it was kind of a, an alternative style vocal. Yeah, and I thought that's that's the sound. That's yeah. the sound for me. I, yeah, you know, it's I just stumbled on all that accidentally. Mm -hmm. I never. You know, when I was planning the whole thing, I never thought, oh, I'm going to have this all, it's going to be like that. I just, I just, I've just always followed my nose. Yeah. And sort of things sort of start evolving and it started turning out and this started happening and it, it's, the church started turning into this thing and I just would let it all happen. And then one day we came up with Unguarded Moment. That's, that's cool. I, I, I was saying to you before, Literally, right before you walked in the door, I had a mum and uh, her son come in. He's probably, I told him to watch, so. And uh, looking at first guitar, it's maybe nine, nine years old, eight, nine years old. And he came in and he saw this room and he asked what was going on. I said, we do some YouTube stuff, Facebook stuff. And he said, oh, have you got anyone coming in? I said, oh, Steve Kilby's coming in. And he said, from the church, I'm, I'm learning under the Milky Way right now. Did you, did you ever think back at that particular time that that song or your songs would be, you know, like uh, Australian anthems? Of course not. Like, imagine when, as I'm writing it and then I say, one day kids all around the world will be learning to play this. It's sort of like, it's like no, you, you never think that. You never think that stuff. Um, you, ju you just, no, it's... You know, it's like, let's write a song, and you write it, and bang it. Did you think it would be a hit? Under the Milky Way? Mm. No. I, right. It was just, I was writing so many songs. I was writing, I was, I was writing a couple of songs every day. Mm. You know, sometimes I'd, if you hadn't seen me for a week, I'd have a cassette with 14 new songs that no one had heard. <laughs> listen to this, listen to this one, listen to this. How long did it take you to write that song? You, you just wrote that at home on an acoustic guitar? I wrote it on a piano. I wrote that one with my girlfriend at the time. Um, I wrote it on a piano and then she came down. And I said, listen, this chord progression. And then we mucked around with the melody and I'd say it would all have been over within about 10 minutes. Right. It wow. was written, there it was go. done. It was written, put to bed. Minutes. We forgot about it. Let's now go and do something else. There you go. Not like, oh, I think we've written a number one hit song mm. that kids will be learning in 30 years time <laughs> on guitar. It's amazing. You were following me around the world at that particular moment because I left I'm originally Canadian and I left Brisbane went back to Canada in 89 uh -huh. and that was a massive hit over there and yeah like, oh my god that's that's I kind of felt proud to be I think of myself as Australian really, yeah but uh, yeah I'm, I'm, moment, what, so. I'm whatever side is winning <laughs> can I ask you about uh, under the Milky Way would you be so kind as to you don't have to but uh, to play the chords for me because I I know it starts with an A minor seven, so you've got that yeah. G. Okay. But do you put the D on the B okay. string in there? Okay. Well, there's two. There's two things. First of all, it's it's two. It probably is two though. guitars with a one one with a um, capo. Right. So, but uh, but the way I play it is this. So the second chord is like an is like an A That's, uh, suspended fourth, isn't it? That almost looks like an that it's, it's 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 A minor and then you add in the D, correct. so it's A suspended fourth. Yep. But of course the oh, revolutionary see. thing about this song is what does the bass play? What does the bass so, play? So so the so the guitar's going But now I'll attempt to do what the bass does with my thumb, so the bass goes. Oh, you put the F sharp in. Wow. So oh, the, that's cool. That's what I meant. So the F sharp comes in on that, on the um. Over the. Uh, over a, over the A suspended four. Four. Yeah. Cool. Which is what makes the, it gives it that, 
Yes. Gives it that thing. Yeah, normally, and then, of normally, course, oh, yeah. and then, of course, with a capo, yes. the other guitar plays <laughs> plays it up here. Right. You know, with the capo there plays the same progression. So you've got one playing it down there, and you've got one playing it up here as well. Do you put the sus four in on the on the bar chord? What's that? Do you put the sus four, the D? Yeah, of course. It's all it's all the same thing. Right. On the up up here on the now up up there on that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I like the way. So if you're watching this at home, can you play your A minor again? Okay. If you're watching that at home, Steve inverts his he's got his third it's finger. supposed to be like yeah, that yeah, isn't it yeah well yeah, it's whatever you can do whatever you like and and you know what here's my you other can thing definitely do whatever every you like. song i've ever written mm. i never play f i always play, oh, play every major fucking seven. song every <laughs> fucking song is that i never play too much uh, too much david bowie for it's, you and, and and here's another thing yeah. when i play g i never use the b string i always mute it Oh, I, yeah, yeah. Okay. My G's are always like that. So you, someone who's you playing, the, oh, you put the so someone who okay. plays my song with a G going, I go, right. don't do that. That's I go, power, power use G. that finger to 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 block that string. You've got your pinky on the high G and your yeah, third finger on it's, the it's D this, note. This there. this finger yeah. is is blocking out the uh, A string. It's muting it. Do you play? If you were to play a C now, okay. So you go back to a normal C. C is yeah. a normal C, I okay. think. But yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's uh, that is the the famous rock and roll G. If you have to, is if that? you're playing Ziggy Stardust, is you that, have to leave that B out. Is is that what they do? Well, yes, pretty much every like ACDC, uh, Mick Mick Ronson, all you know, it just all the doesn't bowl and whatever. It just shouldn't they, be there. No, I that, don't know that why. Major thirds just a bit too too much. So. On the G, it is, but yeah. Everything else works. Yeah, yeah, but just not on the G. Cool. I'm a ma- I I never knew that there was an F sharp, and now we're getting nerdy. But I didn't know there was an F sharp in the base of that A minor because normally people will thumb over the F sharp to a D major. Yeah, but 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 the but the um, which is almost kind of like that, but it's more. It's 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 an it's it is a kind of a D. The A suspended fourth is a kind of a D chord. Yeah, it's close. An F sharp. Yeah. Goes with D, right? Yeah. If you if you took your but, your but you see the thing is the I wrote it on the piano. Oh, see right. you see yeah yeah I didn't write it and go oh um, that on that second chord it should be an F sharp and bass. It's how it was written on the piano. Right. So on the piano it didn't sound like so much mm. because when you move the bass and the chords around on a piano when it's all contained on one instrument it's not such a big thing yeah. but when you have two separate instruments and the guitar is actually playing the a suspended fourth yeah. and the bass is actually playing the f sharp yeah. there's this suddenly there's this really interesting golf yes that yeah. happens between them which has a really and it's strange it seems like nobody else has ever done it before it's like it's, it's it's like I've never heard another song that actually does that it, as got, such. When you play your A minor, you've got your uh, third or second finger on that. That's an E note, and then you put the F sharp in. That's like a second. So if you took uh, if you took your finger yeah, but it's off, no longer an A minor. minor. When you when yeah. the F sharp comes in, it's not yes. an A minor anymore. It's yeah. an A suspended fourth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. With and an and so and the so bass. so the 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 bass um, the bass could be a D. But yes. then it wouldn't have that feeling. Yeah. It has yeah, to, but something fine. about the F sharp, it, it didn't. As I was saying, when I wrote it on the piano, it was okay. I mean, it yeah. still had. It still sounded like under the Milky Way. Yeah. But it wasn't until it actually got transposed onto the guitar and the bass yeah. that the, that real magic happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you showed me that. I just couldn't. Yeah. For the life of me, I've never. I've tried playing that before. And I never put the F sharp in. So. Mm. Yeah. Most excellent. It's it's. Well, it's hard to play it. it for, for me. You saw I, f- I fumbled it. I've seen guitarists who do it really easy, add, add the bass notes in with their thumb. Mm. I'm just not proficient enough to do that. <laughs> well, you wrote it, so uh, yeah, you that, can do that's whatever all you want. Yeah. Speaking of guitars and guitarists, uh, young Ian Hogue is in your band. Yeah. And I was mentioning to you before that I'm pretty sure it was Ian. He may remember this, but uh, I remember him playing guitar at school at our yeah. school and uh up with another guy just sitting on the ground somewhere and i looked at that and i thought oh I, I want to be able to do that so and then of course he became quite successful uh in powderfinger how did you get on to ian like how did that come about well um 
Apparently, um, I don't remember this, but when the church used to play in the 80s, Hoagie and JC, the bass yeah. player, used to hang around and come and hang around after the show and come and ask questions and talk to us and oh, okay. stuff like that. I don't remember that. The first time I really met him was at a pop festival in Launceston um, when they were just absolutely massive. Yes. And yeah. the church when nobody we hadn't we hadn't started our resurgence yeah. we were just and and um ian and i talked a bit and then we met at grant mclennan's funeral right and we yes. we both discovered that we'd been really very close friends of grants and then every now and then i remember <laughs> i remember one one night i was lying in bed at four o'clock in the morning back in the old days of ph phones that oh, were yeah. The phone rang, I answered it, and there's a voice of phone. This voice goes, I know all your songs, but you don't know any of mine. And I went, who the <laughs> fuck is this? It's Ian Hogue. I said, what the fuck, man? You know, call me at a decent hour and hung up. <laughs> and then he, any, anyway, when Marty left the band, I was having a conversation with, and I was saying, the guy, the next guy we get in can't be a little skinny guy with glasses. Mm. He's got to be a big guy and he's got to have his own mojo. He's already, he can't be an unknown. He's got to be some person that's already got their own mojo, got his own stage presence, mm. his own thing. And um, somebody else I knew said, don't you know Ian Hogue? Mm. And I went, as soon as I heard that name, I went, <laughs> that's it. I rang him up. Hello, Ian. Yeah, Steve Kilby. Hi, Steve. What's going on? I said, if, um, if I asked you to join the church, what would you say? He said, I'd say yes. And I said, all right, I'll, my people will be talking to your people <laughs> and hung up. And that was it. And he, he, sort of, he joined on the spot when That's I rang right. him up. Very good timing. Yeah. I think at Powderfinger. They'd broken up. That? Yeah, right. no, they'd broken up. So Ian, I always felt like Ian a, was a guy that needed a band. Yes, I think yes. if there was a, the spirit of Powderfinger, when you saw Powderfinger, mm. the keeper of the flame, the guy, it seemed to me, the guy behind it all, even though Bernie was the wonderful voice up yes. front, it seemed that the rock and roll heart behind that was Ian. Yes. Well, I, I mean, when I went to Canada in 88, 89, I think he was doing covers i could be wrong here i think i think i'm right though covers at the pineapple hotel i don't know if you remember that hotel in brisbane and then when i came back in 91 he was doing the fucking <laughs> theater royale yeah, it was yeah. selling out these, yeah 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 and uh, yeah. locally yeah yeah locally, yeah, you know, yeah. It's yeah the biggest thing since uh, they're the biggest they're the biggest band australia's ever had i think so yeah i think so um do, when you play in the u.s yeah uh I, I think, from what I understand, you guys had more success over there than uh, Powderfinger. Well, they uh, didn't have they... any success. Right. That's they just... didn't really have any success. I think they had some pockets where they'd had a little bit of action. Mm. But the church had like a, like we sold, a, like Starfish sold a million copies. Yeah. So That's a lot. Yeah. When when people come to the gigs, do they know Ian from the other band or the? No, they don't. But Ian, no. it's strange to think now. Ian joined in two thousand thirteen. He's yeah, been in the band six years. Yeah. He's a fixture now. Yeah. Like we do a whole tour and we don't hear one thing about Marty. Like oh, he's no Marty or where's Marty or I'll never think. It's like I think the fans have really embraced Ian. Mm -hmm. um, and he's writing, he's instrumental in the uh, uh, writing process of the new He's group. totally, um, he's totally, the two albums we made with him, he was, he was, every morning he'd be singing and going, I've got an idea, look, and what about this, and what about cool. this, and how about we do this? He was completely one of the, yeah. one of the um, prime movers. Yeah, right. he was no blushing violet. He, he jumped straight in mm. and had a million ideas, which is what we wanted. Yes. Well, I love his, uh, I don't know how he's getting all his sounds. or I, I, I haven't checked out his pedal board. Oh, he's got, a, he's got, a, um, he's got enough um, pedals to sort of cause a, a small <laughs> city in Asia to black out for a night. <laughs> Seriously. Don't, don't There's a Asia. lot of electricity running through those pedals. Yeah. Well, I love the sound of that, that last record. Um, 
I especially like the track, is it called Another Century? Yeah, that was a good song, yeah. Is, is that, uh, I mean, I don't know, did you release singles or anything? For, because that sort of stands out to me. It's like if, if I was in a record company, yeah, song, yeah. which I'm not. No, that's but, a really special song. Yeah, I love the sound of that. Yeah. How, how was that written? Um, I Well, I picked up, we had an Omnichord. Right. And sometimes we just, like sometimes we do, we have exercises that I dream up. And... Um, one of them was I picked up this Omni chord and it's just, you can just play any chord. So I'm not very good at chords. Mm. Like I'm a bass player and mm. I, I can't, if someone said to me, play a C sharp minor on a guitar quickly, I couldn't. Mm. Take, I'd be like, <laughs> but on an Omni chord, you've got every chord there. Right. So I just picked up the Omni chord and I went, ba, 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 ba. I went, that's the first part of the song. And the next part will be, bah, 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 bah. and then the third part will be, oh, uh, 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 what, and then I'm like, now mm. you guys translate that into guitars and drums and mm. bass. We'll play this little, this little chord progression that came off the omni chord. And you know what an omni chord is. People watching sort this of, know what yeah, an omni chord ex is. Explain. explain. It's like a, it's like, it looks like a little plastic guitar yeah. and it's got a button on there to, so you can play an A major, an A minor, oh, okay. an A yeah. seventh. I know what you're talking about. I think that's all it does. I think it does majors, minors, and sevenths. Yeah. So for any, every chord in the book, you can quickly and easily hit this button and it will play that chord. And as long with, as long with a little beat. So you can have, it'll sort of do it um bum bum um bum bum with a bass if you like. Um bum bum um um bum bum um bum. And you can, I think Neil Finn uses them. Yeah, you can certainly hear, you can often hear. Wow, that's how you get that beatly. You can, and without having to f do all the tedious fucking around with a guitar, yeah. you can quickly s see how all these chords will sound lined up with each other. You yes. can quickly jump well, from thing to thing. Well, what's the change when you sing the 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 word something's nice? It, it comes out of the chorus. Yeah, so something's nice. And then there's a chord change over that. And I yeah, love that yeah, chord yeah. change. Is that just going back to the first chord in the song? Or it's go, it is going back for first chord in the song, but it's going from a, it's going from a, um, it's unusual. It goes, it goes F sharp, D, E minor. I think it ends on an E, the, the chorus ends on an E minor, but then the verse starts in a, on an F. Ah, and okay. Yeah, something yeah. about going from the E minor yeah. in the chorus to the F in the verse yeah. gives you this sort of yeah, interesting little that. lift. I love that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I love that sound. I, I think that um, the, the, the American band, uh, I think a lot of bands, but uh, the American band MGMT. Oh, management. Yeah, yeah. I reckon they've listened to a lot of your stuff. Because when I've, I listen to that record, I'm like, oh, yeah. That's I agree cool. with you. I, mm. I, th I think MGMT have listened to us. Mm, yeah. Mm, I think a lot cool. of people have listened to us. Um, a lot of them, a lot of them give us acknowledgement and a lot of them don't. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of people have, have listened to a lot of things that we've done. Just like we've listened to a lot of things that maybe we never gave. You know, I, I, I've just did a lot of listening to, um, a band called Bebop Deluxe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bill Nelson. Yeah. I took so much stuff from him, <laughs> but Bebop you never see me talking about it in interviews, yeah. but it's true. Yeah. And I think a lot of bands have taken a lot of stuff from the church. Um, yes. a lot of really big bands yeah, yeah, um, and some of them, you know, some of them actually do covers and, and other ones, other, uh, and weird things like you read, I read an interview in guitar, someone sent me this guitar magazine, it's Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. Oh yeah. yeah. Who's your favorite guitar band? The church. Wow. What, That's what are your cool. memories of teenage, t of teenage days and you go sitting in my bedroom listening top 40 radio and one night they had metropolis on there by the church yeah, um there's a lot of people a lot of people have been influenced by what we've done mm. um what influenced you when you were younger well i or you know you it, it was it was to, bol it was bowling and bowie yeah it was you know I, of course i love the beatles and stones and dylan and all the rest and i of course i went on loving things after Bolin and Bowie, but Bolin and Bowie was when I sort of went, this is how I can do it. Mm. Up until then, I, I was like, well, this is all very well for the Beatles and Bob Dylan, but I can't be the Beatles or Bob Dylan. That's mm. not me. But when Bolin did it, and then when Bo Bowie did it, I went, now I can see how I can do it. Did you ever get to meet 
David Never Bowie. met either of them, no. Mm. no. Probably a good thing. Yeah. I probably would have pissed them off. <laughs> well, maybe or maybe not. Depends. When you met them, I, you know, I'll show you this after, but I have a signed copy of Lodger yeah. uh, from when he was here in 87. I didn't yeah. go see that tour, but I picked it up at a flea market not so long ago. I couldn't believe it. But uh, I finally got to see him in 2004 on the last tour. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to go in 83. And my mother said, I'll take you. And I'm like, no, I can't go with my mother to David Bowie. And then, of course, 2004, I took my mother. Did you see him live? I, times? I saw him live and it was awful. Oh, wow. And I saw Which... Mark Boland live and that was awful too. You saw Mark Boland live? I saw wow. Mark Boland. I saw Mark Boland in Sydney. Uh, and I went along with my friend. Both of us were incredible T-Rex nuts. Mm. And we went along and Lobby Lloyd opened. Oh, yeah. And Lobby Lloyd was better than T-Rex wow. by a million miles. And Mark Bolan, he, he played for about two hours and it consisted of, his, of six songs that would just go in, like you do get it on. And then he just go into these like half hour guitar solos. All right. So it's just wow. like, mm, 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 with oh. Bolan playing a solo over the top mm. and sort of running around. And even to me and my friend who are the most devoted Mark Boland fans, after about five minutes of this, we were like, this is fucking awful. <laughs> and then I went to see Bowie during the Glass Spider tour. Oh, yeah. That was and supposed to be terrible. It was yeah. fucking awful. I don't yeah. care. I love David. No, nobody on earth could love David Bowie more than me. But the fucking Glass Spider tour mm. was shit. <laughs> It was shit. What did the glass spider actually do? The glass spider came down <laughs> at some stage and he had he had reinterpreted all his songs and had a oh. new look and had a band full of... He had a guy playing the guitar with a golden dildo vibrator. Is <laughs> that Peter Frampton? Wasn't Peter Frampton? Frampton was in it too and there was another guy who was trick. He'd get out this golden vibrator and the, put on the guitar and the guitar was going... Mm -hmm. But whatever it was, yeah. the spirit... Yeah. Of Bowie, of whatever I wanted from Bowie had long, it was yeah. not there. It was like a spectacle. It was like the most pointless, stupid waste of time. And yeah. only, you, you know, I'm not so much of a fan of anybody that I go, I will put up with anything you do. And yeah. I was really disappointed with Bolan. I was really disappointed with Bowie. But I know on other nights, mm. Bolan or Bowie, Bowie at Hammersmith doing Ziggy Stardust or something, yes. I would have been in heaven yeah. but on this particular night like in 1987 yeah, in america in oh, an right. arena yeah it was shit yeah. sorry guys it was really that it was rubbish that tour did get get panned it deserved it. to be panned it was the it was the most feeble thing i've ever seen what do you uh give me some bowie albums that you love well i love I, I love i love man who fell to earth i love hunky dory i love ziggy stardust i love aladdin sane I really, really, really super love Diamond Dogs. Oh, yeah. It's probably yeah. my favourite. on final. And then, and then, of course, Young Americans and Station Station. And then I really love Low and Heroes. And then I pretty much cut out. Mm. Then yeah. I pretty much, it's pretty hit and miss. Every now and then something amazing would come through. Yeah. But a lot of stuff I couldn't. And, you know, I keep meaning to, to go back and... You know, people have said to me, Steve, you've got to listen to Outside. You've got to give it another chance. You've, yeah. got to, you've got to sit down and listen to it and listen to it. Mm. And maybe I will, but... Mm. Um, so the last thing I really liked, I think, was Black Star. Yeah, Black Star was good. Which yeah. I, I found quite irresistible. Mm. And, of mm. course, tonight I'm going to see Lazarus mm. with a completely open mind. Yes. Um, if it's rubbish, <laughs> I, if it's rubbish, I'm, going to, I, I'm not going to be sitting there going, it's David... It, it's, yeah. I, I think David was capable of, he sort of went off the boil. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but he'd yeah. done so much. Yeah, he had a very long it's, career. So. He'd, done so, he'd made so many amazing records. Yeah. He had no more onus on him to do something incredible. No, no. Low is the one on, I can't get on vinyl. You don't, moment. you no. can't find it on vinyl? No. Well, I can find a few, but they're very expensive because right. it went out of print. I think you can get it as part of a box set. Oh, okay. But then, you, you know, I've already yeah. got all the other yeah. ones, so... When I, I, I thought Lowe was a masterpiece and yeah, it got yeah. a lot of bad reviews at the time. Do you know at the time it only sold 15,000 copies? Really? It did oh nothing. God. Wow. But I... Such a great record. I, yeah. I remember the review, 
Charles Shah Murray, who'd been a Bowie expert, oh, yeah, like a yeah, big yeah, champion, he said, if this is what Bowie's going to do, why don't him and Eno just trade tapes in the mail and spare the rest of us the drudgery? <laughs> and I was going, no, yeah. no, no. This is something really, oh. something really special here. I love the, the sound of that. That uh, the, 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 the pop, it's kind of got one side of pop style songs and then the other sides. Like of the, instrumentals, yeah, weird, instrumentals. experimental. Yeah. Bowie sings his own language. Yeah, you know, yeah. subterraneans. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good uh, record. You know, like, when you hear that record, you feel like he wasn't a mere mortal. No. He, he yeah. sort of had a, he had a, a glimpse into another world. Yeah. Mind you, he's playing with guys like Brian Fripp and fucking... Oh, oh, uh, Robert Brian Fripp. Robert Fripp and Brian, Brian Eno, yeah. you know, so... Do you like, uh, you like Robert Fripp, King, uh, King Crimson? Sort of I love before. Crimson and Eno. If I had those guys at my beck and call, I'd... Mm think I could do something pretty good. <laughs> I like Adrian Ballou's uh, guitar work as well on some yeah, of his records. Yeah, I like Ballou. I really don't like Reeve Gabriel's. No, work. same. I don't, yeah. I'm like, yeah. of all the guitarists so, you could have, why did you have him? He was sort of like, that's, yeah. the, that's the sort of guitar playing I hate. I hate mm. that, I hate that sort of guitar playing. Yeah. I love Mick Ronson. Yes. Melodic, Fantastic. powerful, majestic, mm. but someone just sort of going, <laughs> like strangling a cat on yeah. every song. <laughs> I, I couldn't. Never good. I, I don't know why Bowie thought that was great, and I don't know why Bowie had him as a as a mm. full on collaborator. Mm. To me, it, he just. I didn't like Tin Machine either. No, I I recently went back and listened to a little bit of Tin Machine. Tin Machine Two's got a couple of good. Tracks. One good track. Yeah. yeah. Um, La Pura. Uh, oh yeah. yeah oh, yeah, 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 it's but, like. Yeah. It's like in the middle of all this rubbish, suddenly yeah. there's like a Bowie track from the old days, yes. like a track yeah. that was left off Aladdin Sane or something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the Pura. Yeah. This weird chord progression and all of that. Yeah. Every yeah. now and then, over the you know, since the late eighties through to you know, two thousand and sixteen, he would come up with some gems. Under pressure. Yeah. Classic. So like early You know, how can you argue with that? Yeah, yeah. Like he was part of that. I don't mm. know exactly what he did, but mm. the bits he did on that are incredible. Mm. Yeah, and and then Black Star, mm. and um, but then a load of tedious stuff I couldn't understand or get yeah. into at all. Yeah. yeah, there's some terrible. It seemed albums, it so. seemed to me. I'm sorry. It seemed to me he lost his way, mm. and he didn't know he that, and that's something that's never happened to me. I've never mm. lost my way. No, I've always known what I'm doing and where I'm going. Yeah. But I look at Bo I looked at Bowie and it seemed at some point mm. he was bewildered as to what he should do next, I think and he could no longer follow his natural inclination. Mm. I um, think it was good for him to take ten years off because uh, he, he's. He, I think oh five oh four they had reality the reality yeah. album tour, and then no one heard from him for ten years, and then it, and then uh, the next day's. Got some great stuff on Look, it. I had a girlfriend who swore by reality and was always mm. playing, going, listen, I've made this record, it's the best bit of heathen, the best bit of reality, you've got to listen to this, and was always playing and always mm. listened to it. I couldn't get into it. I don't know why. Same. I don't know what it was. Mm. And, yeah, I mean... I don't like the production on it either. Mm? I, I don't know who was producing it. I, it seemed, it just... I, I know losing your way seems a bit of a strange thing, put, way to put it. Yeah. It seemed like... He'd, he'd lost his modus operandi. He didn't yes. know why he was writing songs anymore. Yeah. Whereas up until then, when you hear a song like the Bule Brothers, yeah. you'd go, someone had to write that song. Yeah. It's like, if it, it was necessary to, for someone to write that. Mm. And it's so full of meaning, it's almost unbearable to hear. Mm. And then later on, on albums like Never Let Me Down and Ah, oh, For Christ's Sake, Tonight. Yeah. Um, but even then, Iggy, loving Iggy's the songs. alien. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good and track. Yeah. So in the midst of all this ruin, and <laughs> is a song like "Loving the Alien" with yeah. one of those Bowie chord progressions and mm. the singing, and so you could never really. He he was the master, and you could never really write him off. You Not, could never know what he might come up yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, no, he's fantastic. He was but my childhood hero. Insanely, insanely talented beyond. The like of him, the likes of him only comes along once in a very blue moon. Yes. Someone who's yeah. good at, you know, not not only could he, you know, and he had the best haircut and the yeah. best fucking, cool hair. he had the Flows. best body and the best, <laughs> the way his eyes looked and yeah. his voice and his moves mm. and the shit, 
the, the, you know, the, it, the literary influences and things he threw in. He was just the master. Yes. You know, yeah. there's, only, there's only one of them every hundred years oh, or so. absolutely, absolutely. I read somewhere uh, that he is even more influential on music than Elvis Presley. They have the top, the most influential people on modern music and they put him above Elvis. But of course, what did Elvis, Elvis Presley was a look and a vocal style mm. and a kind of pop star mm. and I would never take that away from him but as a innov musical innovator, mm. he no. wasn't. Yeah. He, I mean, he wasn't. Bowie, Bowie invented all these genres and mm. uh, you can't even compare the two. I mean, do, I, look, I wouldn't take anything away from Elvis mm. but, but, you know, you, Bowie was an, an innovator and a writer and a creator, and, and Elvis was a rock and roll star. That's true. That's very true. Speaking of producers, and I know you're busy, so I won't hold you too much longer, but I was looking at the credits on Starfish, and uh, listed there is uh, Waddy Wachell. Wachtell. Wachtell. Wachtell, it's oh, pronounced, always, yeah. I always pronounce it wrong. How did he get involved? For those for those of you who don't know who he is, he's in the I think he's in Keith Richards' expensive wino band. He it, yeah he Great. is. Um, well, Great it was just player. it was like it was just a case of um, we got signed to Arista Records, and Arista Records said we want you to use these guys, hmm. Waddy Wachtell and Greg Ladani, and we said all right, we will. Never met, never met him. Never before. met them and. Went to LA. Well, I was, I was at that stage. I was confident enough. It didn't to me. It didn't really matter who the producer was going to be because I sort of knew what I wanted to do anyway. It never. The producer helps you get the cream on top of the cake, but I don't need a producer to t tell me what sort of record I'm going to make. I already know what I'm going to do. I just need the producer to help me get it out there and get all the bits and pieces done. So I didn't really care who they were. Mm. I already knew I was going to make, you know, I knew the church was going to make a great record and it, it was really irrelevant whether it was them or you or the dog. <laughs> it's whoever, give me a studio, give me yeah. a fucking producer. I don't care who he is and yeah. I'll make my record. And if the record company's going, well, we're spending all this money and we want you to use these guys, I'm like, fine, mm -hmm. all right. How does it always, how do your records always end up like, just with that sound though it's like it's such a distinct because we know sound and because as i said before if it stops sounding like that someone will go yeah we can't do this because it's not sounding like <laughs> us anymore so yeah. we immediately know how we've got a sound and what we've got to do we're we're aware of our own continuity we're aware of the things that we hate and the things that we can't have on our records mm. You know, you'll never hear a sort of an ACDC riff. You'll never hear a... Bah, bah, bah. You'll never hear that on church record. Yes. It just won't be there. Um, that was a good impression. What's that? That was a good impression. <laughs> or, you know, or, or not because they're bad, just because yeah. they're not for us. Yes. Just like if I, was a, if I had a sort of a cordon bleu restaurant, I would know what I could serve and what I couldn't serve. Mm. And I would know that... There were certain dishes I would never serve in my restaurant and there are others that I will ga take a gamble on. I sort of, this is my thing, this is my oeuvre, I know what the church should be and, and so the other guys in the band were all very well aware of what it should be and we know where the bar is and we can't go below our bar. It has to be, it, things have to have us, they have to be sort of relatively, have a certain degree of comp musical complexity and panache and sophistication it can't just be oh my baby <laughs> it just can't be that you know because there's other people doing that and doing yeah. it much better yeah stadium stadium rock uh after this are you going to england yeah next week i'm going to england right? next week and yeah. you've got some uh, you, you well, have to get the drummer but well if the okay um i have a um I have, a, I have a girlfriend mm -hmm. uh, called Amanda Kramer, and she plays piano in the I Psychedelic Furs. Oh, right. Wow. Cool. Okay. And um, she and I are working on an album of music, mm. and she's got a Steinway in her living room. And I go around her place, and we, I strum guitar, and she plays piano. So she and I are working on music. Uh, we've already done a couple of little tours. We're going to do a, a tour of England uh, in September, she and I, just 
Um, but we, we did some shows in London earlier this year. Um, I love working with piano. And sometimes I get off the guitar altogether and I'm just a singer. I, I finally get to live out my Frank Sinatra dream <laughs> yes. of having this beautiful piano playing behind me and I can, you know, what's new? <laughs> Pardon my asking, what's new? And I can be the crooner. Be a good crooner. I could, I'm the crooner I always wanted to be. Was that a Roy, what was the title of that Frank Sinatra album you had when you were a kid? It was called Only the Lonely. Like it was, uh, so he was covering the Roy? Roy Orbison song? No, no, no. That's oh. way before Roy Orbison. Oh. Roy Orbison's Only Lonely. <laughs> and the Frank Sinatra got one was Each place I go Only the lonely go. Oh, I wonder if... Yeah. I wonder what year that was. It was yeah. like late 50s. Oh. All done in one take on a half-track machine. So the whole band... Like all the instruments, the orchestra and, and Sinatra, one take. Wow. Mic'd up wow. and bang. They, they all nail it. One wow. take. I wonder if... I wonder yeah, there's no that, overdubbing. No. Is that a Quincy Jones? He used to be Sinatra's uh, band leader there for a while. This was, bef this was long before, before that. This was oh. Nelson Riddle, oh, okay, who was, right. who was um, an incredible arranger. So, so when Sinatra would sing about the moon or the rain or the sea, mm. a little instrument in the orchestra would rush in and show oh. you when the stars yeah. came out or when his girlfriend disappeared or even this marvellous moment in what probably my, my most favourite song ever written, a song called Angel Eyes, when at the very end of the song Sinatra goes, Excuse me while I disappear and as he disappears the harp and the violins make this magical music and we see him right before our eyes we see Sinatra disappear that's the sort of shit that got me hooked mm. going holy fuck yeah I want to make music that you can disappear and vanish and appear and magical and wonderful amazing mm. things can happen mm. and luckily it was that record I was exposed to mm. where you had all these guys, so you had the best songwriters in the world. I mean, the songs that he covered on that, on that album, mm. everyone an impeccable torch ballad of lost love. And then you've got this arranger, Nelson Riddle, the top of his game, like a guy you'd get in if they're, you know, making a movie about ancient Egypt or whatever the fuck, and you want the best <laughs> orchestrator you can get, Nelson Riddle. And then Frank Sinatra, who I have to say was singing in a whole new way because up until up until Bing Crosby and Sinatra singing was like <laughs> or or was like when Charleston saw my girl she was on suddenly these nice. guys came along and go no I'm going to sing like I'm in a bar so when Sinatra's like is going excuse me while I disappear he's singing it like that mm. he's not singing it with some oh! <laughs> and so is Bing Crosby mm. these guys for the first time they sang in a conversa conversational way they didn't adopt this way of singing um, that up until then all male singers had had they were like I'm gonna sing like I'm sitting in a bar the piano's playing the girl's there the one that's broken my heart I'm gonna sing to her each place I go, only the lonely go. Not, not with some big fucking assumed persona. I'm going to sing as, a, as just like a bloke singing. Mm. And that's the breakthrough that Sinatra made. His voice was easy to listen to. It was conversational. It was like he was in the room. It was, you could understand who he was. He was, just a, he was just a sad guy walking along a beach or whatever it was in winter and his girlfriend had left him or he'd seen her with another guy. But whatever it was, he was singing it in a natural voice. And that's what I've always tried, that something about Milky Way. It's like, it isn't like, sometimes when this place gets kind, it's like, it's like, <laughs> sometimes, you know, I sang it like in the yeah. studio sometimes when this place gets kind of, it was like that. Conversational. Where did you record? I was um, so I dragged the church up on Spotify, and of course the most popular songs come up under the Milky Way is is there, of course. And then there's another version, which is is 
it's an acoustic version, but yeah. it's not just a strum. Oh, and it's got piano and then. Yeah, what's that? Uh, so, so it's off an album called um, El Memento Descuidado, where we we wrote some new songs and we also went back and rejigged some other songs acoustically. I, f I think quite unsucc in Under the Milky Ways. It's great. Sound I think quite unsuccessfully. Oh. We, f we fucked around with it and didn't do it any favours. Mm -hmm. Unguarded Moment, on the other hand, we got this country, like almost Velvet Underground version of Unguarded Moment, where it turns into this something else. So I think we... I think we rediscovered that one and added to it. I think under the Milky Way, our attempt to whatever we were trying to do with it was a miserable failure. Yeah. And I, I tend now with under the Milky Way, I, I want to just do it as it is. Mm -hmm. Do it as you heard it on the record. I, when with the church, do it. Or when I do it with whoever I'm doing it with, I'm trying to get it to sound like that. I'm not trying to do some new thing with it because people don't want that. I saw an interview with you uh, where you were saying you're, you're very happy to still play that song yeah. because it's, it's a great song, it's a classic song versus... like I Shut up your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I death, no, I imagine but, that. Okay, you're saddled yeah. with a song, right? Yeah. You're saddled with a song. If you're saddled with Under the Milky Way, it's a song, even if, I'm, even if I live to 100 years old and they still drag me out on stage, mm. when I walk out there and go, sometimes when this place gets kind of empty, there will be no contradiction. Mm. It, could be a, it could be your friend, the eight-year-old boy, who's learning to play it when he plays it. Sometimes when this place gets kind of empty. <laughs> a housewife, yeah. an old man, a young man, a foreigner, a, 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 a Native American, an Aborigine... Uh, whoever can do that song it's a universal song it's not about being young and sexy or anything at all it's just like a it's like a abstract comment it mm -hmm. conjures up an atmosphere and it goes away on the other hand imagine being chained to every night you've got to go I would walk 5,000 miles and I would or oh, you yeah. shut up your face or whatever the fuck that novelty song is or yeah. imagine having to sing you're the voice try and understand it <laughs> you know some painful boring turgid but under the Milky Way is like a mere slip of a song it doesn't say anything it doesn't wear out its welcome it doesn't hit you over the head with any philosophy it doesn't say be young and violent or be old and peaceful or anything it's like it's like a it, it, it's like a dessert mm. it's like it's like a beautiful dessert comes out you eat it it takes three minutes and you go gee that was nice and that's it mm. you know what I mean and I'm very that. lucky that yeah. my song that I have to do for the rest of my life forever no matter what I do because if I turn up anywhere and do anything if I don't do under the Milky Way it's simply being churlish mm. because people want to hear it so I'm happy that it is that song and that it isn't, there's nothing in that song that contradictory to wh whoever I am now. You know, mm -hmm. even if I undergo a transition and become a woman and I next appear with breasts and long red curly hair, I can still walk up and go, sometimes when this place gets kind of, a, and it can still be me. You know what I mean? You can come back here and we can discuss that. So. There you go. <laughs> On that cheery note, uh, I'll give you a customary handshake. Okay, mate. Steve Thank Kilby. you, Guitar, Guitar Colonel, oh, for having me on. I and, salute you. And what about Panda the dog who's Panda, just, who's just fearlessly one? helped this whole thing happen? <laughs> She's pretty good until someone cranks the electric guitar and blows or goes, a little. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much, okay, mate. Steve. Right. And... Uh, if you would like to see Steve and the church play in England, uh, I'll post up some links. Well, we, we hopefully... De dependent on drummers. Hopefully dependent on drummers. The church, uh, I think it's the 7th of June, 6th or 7th of June, we're doing our church convention in London, and then we're going to do Edinburgh, Manchester, and I think Liverpool. Mm. Were you just there last year as well? Was it last year or the year before? Yeah, you yeah, 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 we were there last I a, year. I have a friend of yeah. mine in London. She yeah. saw you, yeah. so Susie Stapleton, if you're watching. Yeah. Fantastic. Susie well, Stapleton? Yes. She opened for us. Oh, did she? The guitarist and singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's, she's from Melbourne. She's a mate of ours. Oh, right. Is she Australian? Yeah, she's Australian, yeah. But she's talking with an English accent and stuff she's now. She's been over there a few years. 
Yeah. I didn't know she was Australian. Six, seven, she's wow. certainly Wow, all that time she never said anything. Yeah, yeah, no, she is. She's, uh, I think she's originally Australian. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. No, she, um, I think she's, she's doing Melbourne, well. So. She's sort of like a, she's sort of like a, she was playing with an electric guitar. Black Les Paul. Yeah, and, and she sort of like, her, so. she sort of like had a, Chrissy Hine, PJ Harvey yes. kind of wallop. Yes, that's it. Like a yeah. sort of like, don't fuck with me sort of wallop <laughs> behind her. I, I, I remember standing there going, I hope I never piss her off and she ain't, writes a song aimed at me. <laughs> She's only I, little. I reckon she could, yeah, but I reckon she could rip shreds off you with one of those songs. She is very, she's very lovely. We used to live in the same building together. Oh, ah, cool. And then, uh, yeah, we saw her a couple All right. of times uh, in I'd Melbourne. S- I'll probably be on. seeing her this time around. Hey, cool. We'll say hello. I will. Say hello from us and Panda and uh, uh, good luck, sir. <laughs> Ciao, folks. Oh, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. We need yeah. your subscriptions. Yeah, keep those cards and that money rolling in. <laughs> we only money. need another 300,000. Oh, 300,000 subscribers and money would be good, but uh, it's a tough game. Thank you, Steve. Okay, mate. Rowdy.